I am Arturo Sandoval. I am speaking freely. That's what this is all about, is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the God's children. Welcome to Speaking Freely, a weekly conversation about free expression in America. I'm Ken Paulson. Our guest today is Arturo Sandoval, four-time Grammy and Emmy Award-winning musician. Great to have you here. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I introduced you as a musician because there, there was a time I might have said world-renowned trumpet player, but you are a man of many instruments now, as evidenced by the keyboard <laughs> in front of you here today. I'm a music lover, you know. That's my, my first uh, priority in life, you know, to love music and... Uh, and I play some, a little bit of percussion too, and I'm a composer too, and, I, and I, you know everything around the music. I, I, I have a great time. You have a remarkable story, and this show, of course, is about freedom and the arts. And y you know, you've been fueled by freedom. Your career has been fueled by a thirst for freedom. I think many Americans now know your story uh, from uh, a film of, about your life, uh, for love or country, and uh, that starred Andy Garcia. Uh, in your role. Well, that has to be a strange feeling to see your life story on screen. We're not prepared for that. Yeah. <laughs> we don't used to that kind of thing, you know. And, uh, but I should, tell, I should tell you that uh, I'm very grateful and, and, and to HBO because I believe everybody has a story to tell, you know, mm -hmm. if they decide to tell in the movie my story. I should be very grateful, you know. And, and is it pretty accurate? It is. It's, it's, Actually, they talked to me several times. They hired me as a, as a consultant as well. I, I wrote a score of the movie, too, and uh, I was very close the whole production. Even I were very close to, to the script writer, too, you know, all the time. I, he moved to Miami for a while to interview my family, my friends, everybody. He go on the road with me. And uh, they, they always ask me to be aware, you know, anything is not accurate, is not is exactly the way it was, you know, let them know. And that was my mission there during the shooting of the movie. Well, for those who have not seen the movie and may not have read about your story, it's, it's, it's truly extraordinary. You, you uh, begin studying the trumpet at age 12 and, and become one of Cuba's foremost musicians. And in 1990, you defected uh, to the United States That's true. Uh, with the help of some great musicians and some people in high places and, uh, and went on to become a United States citizen, which is a shorthand way of telling a dramatic and powerful story. Um, you, um, you began early with the trumpet and apparently had a gift from the very beginning. To be honest, you know, I, I grew up in the middle of nowhere of the countryside of the island of Cuba from non-musician uh, family, you know. Nobody was, you know, no musical family, you know. And my, my dad was a car mechanic, and, you know, and then when I mentioned uh, I want to be a musician, everybody turned around and said, what are you talking about? <laughs> no way, are you crazy? No, 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 no. That's not a good profession. You have to do something good, you know. And that was the very beginning, you know. But um, uh, I didn't start right away with the trumpet. Uh, they, uh, I joined a little brass band they put together in my home village, and I, I, um, they gave me to try to several things. They gave me the, the clarinet, and they gave me the trombone, and later, later on they gave me the flute, and the flute made me feel uh, a little dizzy. I said, oh, no, 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 that's not good. And then the bass drum was too heavy. Finally, I started to look to the trumpet with the corner of the eyes, and I talked to the teacher, you know, he, he he was a clarinet player, by the way, he, and, and I said, Maestro, I, will, I would love to try the trumpet. I said, he said, I'm, I'm so sorry, but you know, we don't have any trumpet left. Mm -hmm. I said, what about if I find one, you let me play in the band? Yeah, and then my aunt bought me a pocket cornet, mm -hmm. horrible one, you know, was too old and full of hoses and a lot of places, and you know, somehow I figured it out to blow some notes there. And, they recommend me a, a teacher, a guy who was an old man, a cranky old man in my village. He was supposed to be a wood trumpet player. And I went there and said, Maestro, please, I want you to teach me how to play this. I love this instrument. I said, okay, play something there. I said, I don't know to play anything. 
I said, play something. Well, whatever came out of the horn, I blew a couple of notes. Sound horrible. And he said, you know what? I'm going to give you a recommendation. Don't try. <laughs> Not even try. You don't have any talent for this. Try something else. Put that little things in the case and, you know, get out of here. Because you're never going to make it. And, I, and then I come back to my home crying all the way up, crying and crying and crying. And I, God was so good to me when I get there, I stop crying. I get the horn out of the case and I start to blow. That was exactly 42 years ago and I never stopped. <laughs> in, in choosing a path as a musician, um, to what extent do you have the freedom to choose in, in Cuba? Uh, you know, are, are the jobs available to you as a musician when you begin? How does that work? You know, that's a kind of a bad remember for me because uh, there everything belongs to the government. You, know? right. you have to work for the government. You don't have another option. You know? and, um, and the government will tell you even what to play and where you have to do this and that, a certain amount of this, and you have to, you know. And that was until I was able to defect or leave the country. I have to be, I have to follow what the government asked me to do and play with who and, 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 and what kind of music, and especially when I discovered the world of jazz. You know, that was a big trouble for me because they, they called the, the jazz music the music of the imperialism. Hmm. And, start, and, I don't, and I, they put me already the forehead thin, like I said, I was a pro Yankee. And I was, uh, I, I liked that kind of things, you know. And, uh, well, what is it about jazz, for example, that, that would trouble the Cuban government? You know, the principal thing of the basic things of a jazz music is freedom. And whatever smells freedom to them is dangerous because that, that's not a good example for the rest of the people. And the, the government there is very happy when they deal with people with, which don't have opinion. Or people who don't have, uh, you know, the, the courage to, to, to say something, they are no agree. And uh, when you have, uh, you know, some opinion or some ideas of what a freedom means, that's very problematic for them. So do you recall the first time you heard jazz? I was playing music for, for a while, for a few years. I, I started playing in my home village uh, traditional Cuban music, and then I got a scholarship to get a classical training in the National School of Art for three years. When I came out of the school, I started playing a big band there, and some of the musicians, they knew a little bit about jazz, and they mentioned that to me, and some of them played for me the very first jazz record I ever heard. And I was, I was so lucky because they played for me Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker. Mm. When I hear that, I say, oh my goodness, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> and uh, till today, I'm still trying to figure it out what I was playing, you know. And I was so lucky because later on, I, I met Dizzy Gillespie, exactly 10 years later, when he, his first visit to Cuba in 1977, you, I met him there. You made some special efforts to meet Dizzy Gillespie, didn't you? That's, that's true. That's true, because uh, I, I can't remember exactly who called me and said, Arturo, I know you like Dizzy Gillespie very much. You're always talking about him and so on and so on. He's coming to Havana today. I said, mm. what? No, 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 you're kidding. Because for 17 years, of, yeah, about 17 years, non-American people visit the island. Dizzy Gillespie was in that boat. It was a, a cruise that you, it was doing a, a jazz cruise through the Caribbean. And, Stan Getz was in that boat too, and Air Father Hine was a group of great, great jazz musicians, you know, and we played with them. And, um, but to get to that boat that day and meet him, oh my goodness, that was painful, that was difficult, difficult. And at that time, you know, even if my English is funny now, at that time it was zero, nothing, nothing. I'm trying to improve my English since I'm in America, but, but, but you know, I live in the wrong city. I live in Miami where <laughs> <laughs> nobody speaks English. And uh, I try, but uh, no, you, you ask some people there something in English, they reply to you in Spanish, no matter what. And um, is it, finally, I met Dizzy. And is it true that you drove him around? That's that true. I, I, 
I couldn't talk to him because I couldn't speak the language at all. But I was so lucky some guy walks behind him and talked to me in perfect Spanish. Say, said, can I help you? He said, yes, you can. <laughs> of course you can. And, um, and then he, this, he asked me if I got a car. I said, yes, I got a little car. At that time, I got a Primus 1951, which mm -hmm. was my very first car. And um, I just spent it with, with the brush, with tar uh, and, and gasoline, you know. I diluted the tar and gasoline. It smells so funny. Mm -hmm. And it looks horrible. <laughs> the passenger door doesn't open. He have to get through <laughs> the driver door. That was And then he asked, he asked me, he said, hey, this is a Russian car. I said, no, 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 this is an American car. This is a Primus 1951. I said, I've never been here in Havana. And you're going to show me the city? I said, sure. Wow. Yeah. So far, I, I never told him that I was a musician. You know. And uh, I drove in all over the city all day long. That evening, somebody you know, from the government, they organized a kind of a get-together with uh, visitors and a local musician. And, um, and that was funny because I, I drove him back to the boat late afternoon and then we meet again at night in that theater and um, when he come back I was warming up with my trumpet backstage you know and he look at me like this and said oh my goodness what the heck my driver is doing with the trumpet <laughs> <laughs> and somebody said no he's a trumpet player he said no he's my driver <laughs> that's great and from there on you know and I'm, I was so fortunate and lucky because we became good, good, good friends, you know. We all know the story of people who have uh, uh, fled Cuba um, in, in many different ways, uh, many to um, avoid political oppression. And uh, the story told in the film is you really are, are seeking f freedom of expression in music. And uh, in fact, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but when you're being interviewed at the embassy, there's skepticism that, that you actually have lived a pretty good life in Cuba. You've been treated as a mm, celebrity. <laughs> but that wasn't true. <laughs> okay. Uh, but the reality is that you, you did look for musical freedom. And could you talk a little bit about that as a musician, what it means to you to be able to play what you want? Yeah, I, I strongly believe you appreciate or you understand 100% what the freedom means is when you lose it or when you never knew freedom and you discover what it is. And that's what happened to me. And I believe I was born when I was 40 years old when I get here. Mm. Because I, I remember all my time in Cuba, I have to be extremely careful what to say and how and what kind of interpretation the government could made out of my word. And I, 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 without freedom, there's no life. That's, that's my bottom, bottom line, you know. Freedom is the first line of priorities in any life, and especially if you are an artist, if you got something to say, you got something to express. Of course, without that freedom, how how can you open your heart and and, and give what you have to, you know? And um, not only as a musician, as as a, as a regular person, you feel completely oppressed. You know, you feel like trapped, and you. You don't have any kind of um, liberty to, to, you know, to, to do anything as a human being. They, they, they get, in, you know, they also, even in your private life, you know, and that's horrible. That's horrible when you feel that pressure. Somebody's telling you what to do, and you have to be very careful how you look, how you talk, and and um, that way it's impossible to live. It's impossible. Your frustration in time leads to a decision to to leave Cuba, and uh, you develop a plan that would allow you, while you're abroad with uh, Dizzy Gillespie, to be able to to come to the United States. And ag again, I mean, it's your very good friend uh, Dizzy who who makes the connections you need to have made. He apparently had close ties to the White House. You feel very uncomfortable when you have to escape from your own land. And you know you are not allowed to come back. Let me. I didn't come back there in 13 years. I still have a lot of relatives there. But um, that plan was just so simple. The, the Cuban government made a mistake. 
And that was a kind of mistake, a mistake that I was waiting for many years. You know, they make a mistake giving my wife and younger son uh, a permission to go and spend a vacation with me in Europe. That was the, you know, I said, wow. And I, coincidentally, I was with Dizzy in Europe doing the tour. When they get to London, actually, when I arrived there, I talked to my wife. They were safe already, and then I talked to Dizzy for the first time about that. I said, this, I don't come back to Cuba. I said, what? I said, yes. My wife and son, they're out of Cuba, and I, I don't want to come back. I said, wow, that's a big decision. I said, yes. Are you sure? That, yeah, I'm absolutely sure. Next morning, we went to the American Embassy, this and me. We asked for political asylum, you know, to get all the paperwork and everything. And, you know, he helped me a lot with that because, you know, when we get there, the ambassador attend him and say, Mr. Gillespie, yeah, yeah, and then, you know. But later on, of course, that's papers start to, you know, a little bit of bureaucracy, a little bit of uh, problems, and, and, and I couldn't get the, the asylum that day. Mm -hmm. I continued that tour. And um, the ambassador said, we're going to work on it, and we'll let you know, you know, but you keep on tour with And I... I was in the middle of the tour. I was in Italy later on when my wife called me and said, we are in big trouble over here. The people from the Cuban embassy, they're looking after us. They, they know what we're trying to do, and they're trying to send me back to Cuba. Hmm. When I hear that, I started checking. I said, wow, if they got then, you know, everything is lost, you know. And, um, and then I, I wept him this in the middle of the night and said, this, I need your help. I cannot wait to finish the tour. And this is the situation. This is what is going on. Since God, my wife was in a safe place, safe, a safe place in a, in a friend of mine in, out of London. Nobody knew her, but they was really desperately looking for her, my son. Mm. And I explained to him and say, he said, let me call the White House. I said, what? <laughs> he said, yes, I'm going to call the White House. Give me my wallet. And then I started to look for the, the car. The vice president at that time was Don Quayle. And uh, he said, he just gave me the car because he just come back from uh, Namibia, actually. This was in the Air Force One, mm -hmm. in the way back and forth to Namibia for the liberation of the country, something. He, he was one of the guests of the White House. And uh, he met a lot of people, you know, from White House, and all of them gave him, you know, business cards that I say, if you ever need anything, please call us. And uh, when he said that, I, said, I, I got a vice president card over here. I'm going to call him. We <laughs> said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I, you know, I was so, you know, nervous, and, and you know, because it's, it's a, a lot of tension there, that kind of situation, you know. Right. But uh, he did. He called the White House. And then somebody talked to me in the phone. He handed me the phone and asked me a few questions. And, and I talked to them and said, my biggest concern is my wife and son in London. And then don't worry, we're going to call London right away now. They're going to try to get them. And, and um, that was, uh, you know, and at uh, the same time he said, don't move where you are. The ambassador there in Rome is going to call you. I was in a little city in, mm -hmm. in, in Italy. And, um, and a few minutes later, the ambassador, the American ambassador called me and said, I got instruction from the White House to help you to go to America. I said, wow. And then I asked for my wife and son. I said, don't worry. They are on the way to the American embassy already in London. They picked them up, and they are on the way to there. They're safe. <laughs> and um, from there on, you know, we flew to New York, and we met in New York. And, she didn't know where we were, and I didn't know exactly, but finally we get together in New York, and um, that was the happiest moment in my life, you know. Let me ask you a, a tough question, and I'm sure you've, you've given this quite a bit of thought. When you traveled around the world, you were traveling as a representative of Castro's government. I used to. Right, exactly. Way back. <laughs> Way back, right. But that's, and, and there were opportunities for you because you were representing Castro's government, and and you played in the in Dizzy's UN Orchestra, mm -hmm. um, and today 
there are many who, especially in the Miami area, who say we shouldn't attend performances by musicians who represent Castro's government um, or people who are too friendly to Castro's government and call for boycotts of those musicians. I agree with that, 100%. And yet at one point you would have been, if you would have been hurt by that. Yes. Of course, but that's, that's the, the, the price we have to pay, you know, to represent the wrong government. Right. And, uh, and you have to understand there's a lot of pain there. there those people in, in South Florida and all, you know, every Im immigrant from Cuba, we have been suffering a lot. You know how many people die in that little stretch of Florida? A lot, a lot of people die, you know. Just recently, they just uh, executed three young people because they were trying to s steal a, a boat to escape, you know. And um, if you, for example, a few artists in Cuba now, after that incident, they signed a letter to supporting that they execute mm -hmm. those young people. Can you imagine if mm -hmm. we go to attend one of those concerts, the people who just did that? How we should feel about, uh, how we sh we should react about that. Of course, we have to, uh, you know, keep those people uh, in their where they belong, you know. But don't come, to, especially go to Miami. You know, it's like a, you know, a band who, a favorite band from Hitler, go to Israel, mm. the middle of Israel. Yeah, yeah, we represent the Nazis, and we are here to play for you. It's exactly the same thing, you know. You, uh, you have used your freedom in, uh, in the past decade to produce a, a number of remarkable albums. I think the greatest surprise, though, was when you set down the trumpet and released an album called My Passion for the Piano. Uh, very few people knew of your talent on the piano. Had you been hiding this? <laughs> no, to, to be honest, what happened is I wasn't able to get a piano in Cuba mm. because the government uh, provides the instrument. It's not a music store where you can go there and buy an instrument. And I was in the papers as a trumpet player. When I went there and said, I need a piano because Dizzy Gillespie actually told me, you should learn some piano. The piano is the best tool to learn music in general, to be an arranger, to be a composer, to even to understand the, 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 the language of jazz, you know. To, to really be able to improvise, piano can help you a lot. And from that moment on, I was desperate trying to find a piano. And the government said, no, you're a trumpet player. You're not allowed to. <laughs> I said, oh, my goodness. And then I bought my first piano when I was 40 years old when I got to Miami. Mm -hmm. That was my first, very first piano. <laughs> What I found very impressive is that once you came to this country uh, and you had your freedom, it was still very important to you to become a U.S. citizen. That's correct. And uh, it took longer than it should have, and people had to speak up for you to make it happen. But uh, why was it important to you to be a citizen of this country? You know, I moved to this country body and soul. Together, you know, I don't, I don't want to be the, my body here, my soul, and my brain is somewhere else. I move here, and I'm gonna die here, and my family is very happy to be here. My sons are growing here; they make a beautiful career, you know, and and, and um, I feel much better when I feel I belong to this country, and this country rep I represent America, and America gonna represent me, and especially when you travel a lot. It's a horrible feeling you don't have any country. Mm. If you have any problem, what embassy are you going to go? <laughs> mm. You don't have any embassy. You don't have any, you know. And not only that, it's, 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 it's inside you need that kind of uh, support, you know. 
I said, I belong to here. I work for this. And I, everywhere I play, I represent America. The man who had played and been honored at the White House deserved to be a citizen, and, and in fact, that, that occurred. It's been a, a pleasure visiting with you, and, and it's insp inspiring to hear your story. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I keep, keep this program because the freedom is the most beautiful thing on earth. Arturo Sandoval. Could you uh, do us a favor of uh, closing the show with a bit more of your music? Yeah, I'm going to play a little, a little blues. What Great. about that? <laughs>